Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We're going to start the webinar in just about two minutes. We have quite a few people signed up, so we just want to give people a chance to get into the get into the Zoom app and get a little settled. And then we'll we'll begin in a couple minutes. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone, we're excited to see you today. My name is Tom Strong. I am the Director of Employer Activation at the National Fund for Workforce Solutions. And today we are um, gonna be talking about a new tool that um, we have published with our partners at the Workforce and Organizational Research Center, which we call our Job Quality Outcome Maps. And they're really about, as the title here suggests, for businesses that are making the choice to invest more deeply in their own workers, especially their frontline workers, what kind of business results are possible when you redesign those jobs? I see a couple of people um, entering the chat. So let's move ahead to the next slide. As you join, as you get settled in, please feel free to use the chat. You can introduce yourself. If you want, please do like tell us who you are, what your organization is and um, where you're based. We would, we would love to know that. This is a Zoom webinar rather than a Zoom meeting. So it's a listen only mode for attendees, but we are very happy to hear your questions. We want to know what questions you have as we go through this. You should feel free to ask questions at any time. If you look down towards the bottom of the toolbar, there is actually a Q&A function um, where we can keep track of the questions as they come in and keep them in order. Um, you should also feel free to, to use the chat as you go through the session. And as you're seeing from pop-up window, I'm sure as you join, this is a recorded session. Um, so all the lovely detail that we're gonna share about this new, um, this new toolkit um, will be available to you again. We'll make the recording available later on. It's wonderful to see you all today. Well, let's get on with the show. Um, next slide, please. So what we're gonna talk about today is a new tool that is really about um, answering the question, like how do you design jobs to both improve job quality and improve business outcomes? This is a question a lot of researchers have shown increasing interest in recent years, um, especially given some of the labor dynamics in the market that we have seen over the last couple of years with, with COVID, the aftermath of the pandemic. We're gonna start off, I'm gonna say a few words just about this concept of job quality and why we decided to map it. And then I'm gonna pass it over to our main speaker for today, who is Ellen Frank Miller. She is the founder and chief scientific officer at the Workforce and Organizational Research Center. Um, and with a colleague of hers, she is the principal designer of this new tool. Um, and she will tell you how it works and how you can use it in your organizations or with partner organizations. We're then gonna take a little bit more of a practical use, uh, practical look at the job quality maps in use. And our other two guests today are Elise Smith, who's the Director of Inclusion and Sector Strategies at Kentuckiana Works, um, one of our member partners in the National Fund Network. And she's here with her uh, employer partner, Tracy Whitaker, who's the Senior Vice President of Human Resources at Masonic Communities in Tech Kentucky. Um, we will be taking questions throughout and we'll respond to them. Um, whenever there's an opening, but we're also reserving plenty of time at the end of this talk for an, a free form Q&A. Next slide, please. So for those of you who may be a little less familiar with the National Fund, I just wanna say a few words about us. Um, we are a network organization um, that partners with uh, community-based funding groups and workforce development groups in 32 different regions of the United States. And what we do is that we collaborate with workers, with, their, with employer partners, 
and with entire communities to try to advance a skilled workforce, promote good jobs, and invest in equitable outcomes. And everything we do is really integrated through a lens of racial equity and inclusion. We approach this work from four different what we call solutions, um, which are all intended to address a different aspect of where innovation is possible in the workforce development system, and what I might call also the workplace development system. So those four solutions are co-invest for impact, which is really about how we pool our funds, partner together, and build economies of scale. Changing systems for improved outcomes is another solution that's really focused on how we get stakeholders from government, from CBOs, from employ employers, workers, all kind of moving in the same direction um, for better outcomes for all. Equipping workers for success is our third solution, which is really focused on both advancing and elevating worker voice and worker empowerment and choosing the careers that they want to have and finding the futures that they want to have. And finally, the solution that I work on um, that's really kind of the focus of the, today's content is activate employers to make jobs better, which is all about how we in the workforce system can really more effectively partner with employers in our regions to not just create new jobs, not just train people for jobs, but also transform workplaces and hopefully entire communities um, through the power of partnership with employers. Next slide, please. So we have a couple of polls for you today. We just wanna get a little bit of understanding of who is here with the first poll. So I'll pop in a second. So just tell us, a, you know, in this poll, tell us who you are, what kind of work do you do? Let's see what the options are on the screen. I'll give this poll 20 more seconds. All right. So you, everyone can see here are the results. Not surprisingly for our network, the bulk of uh, attendees here are in the workforce development space. Um, but we have a number of folks who work as business or organizational advisors, a few funders, some researchers, one trainer, um, and a couple of employers in the audience, as well as some, some folks who may not fit into any of those categories. So that's great. Thank you for sharing. Next slide, please. So I want to frame, we're going to get to Ellen's discussion in a second, but I just want to frame what she's going to talk about by kind of touching on current events a little bit. There is a paradox in the labor market today and it's drawn a huge amount of attention. And I think these two quotes from recent um, journal articles, magazine articles kind of give the sense of that paradox. On the one hand, a lot of people realize that this is a great time to get a good job. 74% of people in the most recent Gallup poll said this, which is the highest percentage they've ever found for that metric in 20 years. At the same time, there's 11 million job openings that are unfilled in the United States, which is 5 million more than the total number of people who are actively unemployed, who are searching for a job, but don't have one. So there's a lot of jobs out there, far more than the number of unemployed people. What well, gives? Why are, we, why are not more people employed at this point? We've had tremendous uh, employment growth pretty much every month for the last year. And yet still, it's, we're not all the way recovered yet. What is holding us back? Next slide, please. So we at the National Fund, we look at this question a lot. And the thing is that, especially with the impact of the pandemic, there is a lot of barriers that people are still struggling with that, are working to our, that, that they are working to overcome. COVID-19 remains at the forefront of a lot of this. Um, it has continued to have impacts, even if you're not, you know, you're trying to get back to the office, and has continued to have impacts on childcare, on transportation access, perceptions or real uh, effects on work safety. Um, it is also really highlighted disparate impacts by race um, and, and gender. Um, the, 
the people who have lost their jobs or have not successfully gotten a new job um, in the labor market in the past year really fall along certain demographic lines that have been particularly harmful for people of color, particularly harmful for women. Another factor that's figured into this is that there is a lot more demand than there used to be for remote work and companies are struggling to figure out how they're gonna accommodate that. Um, entire city and regional governments are struggling to figure out how they adapt to this new reality. Um, that's gonna, something that's gonna have huge impacts in our communities and our society for probably years to come. Another factor is that COVID uh, disproportionately affected elderly people. And a lot of people who were you know, still working chose to retire early um, because of the impact of COVID in their industry. Um, some of those were planned retirements, but a lot of them were not. And a lot of those people may not be sure if they wanna come back to the workforce at this point or not. There has also been, um, for, because of the pandemic and because of other factors, significant reduction in immigration work permits in the United States over the last several years. And there are, just, there are fewer documented immigrants who are coming here looking for jobs. A lot of them may feel that they're not as welcome. And that is also another thing that is impacting a lot of workforce data right now. Women, as I mentioned before, disproportionately dropping out of the workforce, and many people are just rethinking, what does work mean to me right now? They have maybe have a chance to really rethink their relationship to the world of work for the first time because of how the pandemic has played out, and they want something different. And that's what employers have to get their head around more than anything else, is that the labor market has changed in that way. Next slide, please. So what we want to communicate to employers is that whatever, whatever kind of business that you are in, this is a time when you need a people strategy. A lot of companies right now are realizing that if you want to grow, you need people to grow. You need to be able to hire talented people. You need to be able to retain them. And not every company has always thought through what it means to have a strategy on this specific topic before. And that's okay, we're here to work with you, we're here to help you think that through. Companies don't become employers of choice by accident. There's usually a strategy involved. And the truth is, is that there, there are a lot of business tools that entrepreneurs and business leaders are trained in that we don't always think to apply to the world of workforce and workplace development. Um, we're in a, one of those tools is called a value proposition. When you have a new customer, you want a value proposition to bring them into your um, customer base, to make something for them that they will value and they want to come back again and again. Same thing goes with your relationship with your employees. Every company needs a value proposition for the people who do work at your company or who might work at your company that really speaks to their needs but can also help meet your needs as an organization at the same time. The tool that we're introducing today, these job quality outcome maps, this is what they were created to do. They're not something that they're not a scale for understanding what kind of an employer you are. They are really first and foremost about understanding the opportunities for improvement as an employer to build that value proposition with your workers. And to tell you lots more about them, I'm going to pass the microphone over to our colleague Ellen Frank Miller. Thank you, Tom. Um, next slide, please. So it's, I'm just delighted to be here today. Um, and uh, at the Workforce and Organizational Research Center, our motto is better jobs mean better business and the science backs us up. Um, so I'm gonna give you a quick taste of the research evidence that demonstrates that improving job quality is good for the bottom line. And these three examples draw on three different research designs with different types of data to show that this claim is backed by you know, robust findings. So first, the GAP partnered with academic researchers to experiment with improving work scheduling practices for their store associates. So experimental designs are the gold standard for identifying cause and effect. So what they did is they matched a set of stores with similar characteristics and then randomly assigned some of them to change how they scheduled people to work and others to keep doing what they were doing. So the stores that changed practices to give more notice and control over work schedules dramatically increased median sales and productivity. 
So as Tom mentioned before, Gallup does great survey work. Um, their 2020 engagement survey, they found that the highest engagement companies beat out lower ranked companies on things like profitability and turnover. And then Just Capital looked at a third kind of data, so wage data, administrative data for their living wage rankings. And the top companies in their living wage ranking delivered much higher returns for investors than those at the bottom. So these are all dramatic findings. Next slide. So next we'll do a poll about your organizational priorities and Mikaela will help us out. Oh, there it is, go ahead and enter your responses and then I think we'll give a moment. And I'll just say, even if you're in the workforce development field, pretty much all of us work for a company that probably has multiple employees. So. This should be relevant to you too. What, what outcomes are most important for your organization from a workforce standpoint right now? Okay, not a surprise, retention, number one. Um, this is great, thank you all for doing this. Okay, if we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so now let's take a look at the job quality outcome maps. So my research team did an extensive review of decades of organizational research to identify correlations between employers' KPIs, so their key performance indicators, and job characteristics. And the maps that we're gonna show you are based on findings from over 3000 peer reviewed scientific studies. Um, and I'll go into the specifics in more depth um, in just a minute. So next slide. So the maps serve two purposes. First, to help employers focus on the KPIs they want to impact by improving job quality. And second, to act as a framework to measure outcomes. So in other words, to measure whether your efforts are getting you the results that you want. Next slide. So the way this works is that you start with your KPIs. So what are your organization's top priorities? What's in your strategic plan? You know, what will make or break you in 2022? And I guarantee your workforce is key to achieving those goals. Uh, next slide. So here on the left, you'll see you use the maps to focus in on, and I'd say the one or two KPIs you plan to address by improving one or more of the job characteristics, the categories there on the right. So next slide. Now this is always when I get asked, well, which one is the best one? Which should we choose? So on the next slide, all of these correlated job characteristics you see with those colorful diamonds there can be impactful. And we'll dig deeper into this in a moment. Um, but the important point here is that there are a wide range of options. So every employer can improve job quality for business impact, no matter what constraints they face. Okay, so then how do you choose where to focus? Next slide. Ask your employees. So this is where organizations can leverage the power of employee voice to meet their goals. So if you pick a correlated employee, a characteristic, to, you know, if you've got a KPI, you pick a characteristic to improve, the evidence suggests that you will move towards your KPI. But if you choose a job characteristic that is a high priority to your employees and correlated with your KPI, you improve your chances of impact dramatically. So, and additionally, gathering input from employees sends a message that you're committed to their well being. And that's in, impactful in and of itself, as we'll see in a moment. So, next slide. So the high level themes that emerged from doing this mapping were these, job design matters and relationships matter. So as you can see here, these five job characteristics are associated with all of those KPIs. And notice that one of them is perceived organizational support. So there's the power of incorporating employee voice. So next slide, we're gonna dig a little deeper. 
And I do want to point out that a glossary of terms is available in the back of this deck, which will be made available to you. Um, so there are seven categories of job characteristics here, and we're only going to run through them quickly today. Um, but on the next slide, the first is what we're calling elements of the job experience. So this includes things like how much autonomy people have in doing their jobs every day, how much variety their jobs include, um, how meaningful their work is to them, um, and importantly, how supported they feel by their organizations and coworkers. Uh, the second category is pay and benefits. And these are extremely important characteristics. They are table stakes. Without adequate pay and benefits, you cannot have a high quality job. Next slide. So the next is health and safety, um, the work environment, uh, very important today with COVID, and then uh, work-life balance and the terms of employment, meaning, you know, what's the deal between employee and employer? Um, are there growth opportunities, you know, growing skills, advancing in your job? Um, is the job secure? On the next slide. So representation is next, and this goes beyond unionization to include things like worker councils um, and other formalized ways that employees can have input into organizational decision making. Um, and then finally, and extremely importantly, supervision quality. So the old adage that people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses has empirical support. Uh, next slide. So I wanna briefly show you the breakdown of characteristics by the different KPIs. Those were those little diamonds on the previous slides. So this first slide is for turnover intention. And you can see that five of the seven categories of characteristics are represented here. So if reducing turnover is your goal, which it was for many here, um, there's a universe of job characteristics that you can start with. And they're all shown here. On the next slide. So commitment is the flip side of turnover intention. It's your intention to stay, um, to stay and help make your organization successful. And these are the characteristics that are correlated with commitment. And you can see it's a smaller subset here. Next slide. Individual performance. And here we mean how well someone is getting their work done and meeting their goals. Um, and this is another subset of characteristics. So you'll notice there's overlap, but there are also unique combinations. Next slide. So here is engagement. And you can see here that there are a lot of levers that employers can pull to increase engagement at work. And remember those Gallup findings, strong engagement is incredibly impactful for meeting organizational goals. Lots of options here. Next slide. And finally, we come to an extremely timely KPI in these COVID times, which is burnout. And you'll notice here that if reducing burnout is your focus, Raising wages isn't likely to get you there, but there are many, many other job characteristics that can really make a difference. Uh, next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom for a moment. So one of the things about the National Fund as we have picked up from my initial slide is we see all of our work through a lens of um, equity and inclusion, and we tend to put race first when we think about that, because race has had such a disparate and kind of fundamental impact on so many systems in the United States, uh, including and perhaps especially in the workforce system. So we think about racial equity and inclusion a lot. We also think about diversity, diversity along a broader scheme and how that impacts access to good jobs as well. The research that lies behind these job quality maps is backwards looking research. And as Ellen mentioned, it goes back like 30, 40 years even. A lot of that research has proven itself to be very durable, but it wasn't always examined through an equity lens. In fact, those kind of research projects, unfortunately, have tended to be more recent in the United States. So on a very fundamental level, one of the ways that we hope to expand this project in the future as maybe research opportunities arrive is to surface more connections, more opportunities for looking at job quality and business outcomes with that DEI lens. At the same time, there are a few things that we can say about quality jobs and equity and inclusion that is clearly true right now. So one real, really clear thing is that there is um, 
still a great deal of segregation and the leadership of many companies versus the frontline work workers of many companies. And for that reason, from an equity standpoint, it's really important to concentrate on how you can foster job quality in the front lines of companies, as well as up in the management hierarchy. Because you really can't have equity if you have an economy where bad jobs or kind of jobs that people really can't thrive in are so commonplace. Um, there's also a potential for alignment here that a lot of the pathways for companies to really achieve the DEI goals that they have laid out, there's an opportunity there to really focus on job quality as one way to approach that problem. And finally, evaluation itself, the research that we do is fundamentally, um, it is shaped by the researchers themselves um, and the perspective that they bring to their research. So having an equity inclusion lens with job quality, with business outcomes, can hopefully, if we can, if we can expand that lens, can hopefully serve as new opportunities to understand this body of work. Great, thank you, Tom. Next slide. So to review, using the job quality outcome maps can help you focus your efforts. So you want to start with the end in mind. So we start with what are the most pressing business imperatives? Then we raise employee voice to target the most important areas to improve job quality for impact and figuring out how to make change effectively then really takes collaboration between employees and leadership. And by starting with raising employee voice, you've set the stage to do that. Um, and there are many great techniques out there to help with innovation. Um, and then finally, here's my researcher plug, start with the end in mind and do not make a move until you have a plan to measure your results. Um, you've got to get that baseline in order to see if your efforts are working out the way that you intended. Um, and next, we will hear an example of the job quality maps in action. So thank you all so much. So this, this is a pretty theoretical topic that literally draws on theory as well as decades of research. To help you all understand how you might apply these, we invited um, Elise Smith, who again is the Director of Inclusion and Sector Strategies at Kentucky Anna Works, and her um, employer leader, um, partner Tracy Whitaker, who's a senior vice president of human resources at Masonic Communities and Masonic Communities in, in Kentucky. And they have been working together to utilize the, the job quality maps to help them shape a couple of projects. And at least, do you want to say a little bit more about the genesis of that effort? Yeah. And thank you, Tom. Uh, so a lot of this work, most of this work lives with employers. So I just feel like I'm oftentimes the connector of like, hey, there's this great idea and I think you employer can run with it. So Tracy's been great for uh, working with me on that. But I will say um, I was first um, acquainted with Tracy and Masonic Homes through the Health Careers Collaborative of Greater Louisville, which is an, uh, a sector-based industry partnership that Kentucky Anna Works staffs, but is made up of healthcare employers, both acute care and long-term care um, in, in the Louisville area, along with our education and other community partners in that space. So uh, Tracy was an active partner in that group. And then I heard that the work that she did at Masonic Homes, um, particularly around surveying her her staff on what they wanted out of their workplace was something that really inspired uh, a survey that went region wide that was sponsored by our local Sherm chapter. So that Tracy was out there, you know, in the front of this, making sure that her worker voices were being heard um, was one of the key, um, I don't know, selling points that really made me want to uh, ask her to partner with us on a grant we uh, got through the National Fund for Workforce Solutions, the Redesign Jobs Resilient Workers Grant. Um, so, so that's how I really got connected with uh, Tracy on this job redesign work. And I will say, as far as the outcome snaps are concerned, they were really helpful, um, not only with Tracy, but with the other employer partners that we've had in this, um, this project with us. Talking about job quality is, is really tricky. It's a very squishy topic to begin with because like we, 
we don't have our you know exact definition of job quality and then you're also i don't know you're, you're placing yourself firmly in an employer's lane when you're talking about job quality right um and especially when you consider what ellen said a few minutes ago like you can't have a high quality job if you're not thinking about wages, if you're not thinking about benefits. So how do you really have that conversation without sounding too judgmental, you know, as somebody who doesn't, who isn't in the business of employing other people, talking to somebody who is. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like having the job quality or outcomes maps really helped us have some firm ground to navigate that conversation from. And, um, I will leave it there and uh, answer any questions from like, the community, you know, development perspective as needed. But Tracy, I'll, I'll throw it over to you to kind of finish up the thought. Okay, thanks, Elise. You know, Elise is right. We've uh, <clears throat> we are paths have crossed for a number of years, and I've always been impressed with the work that Elise and Kentuckiana Works uh, bring forward. The leadership in Louisville is amazing from this standpoint. So hats off to you, Elise, because when I got the call from you a year ago to participate in the program, I really didn't know what it was all about, but I knew that it was gonna be beneficial no matter what, because I could always count on you for that. Really good resources. So my home's Kentucky. We are a full service senior living community. We have three campuses in Kentucky and we were founded in 1847. So our organization has been around for a very long time. <clears throat> and we serve, um, we serve uh, seniors, all seniors. And our Louisville campus, we have a, also have a pediatric daycare. So we add diversity in that respect as well. Um, with those levels of care, that goes all the way from independent living up to long-term care. And we also have a home, home care business. So we've expanded and we've become very diverse over the years. We have about 700 employees and we serve thousands of residents every year. So the two key areas that we have been struggling with, um, well, before COVID, as in addition to you know, COVID hit and then it really decimated the whole healthcare workforce, is nursing and hospitality. Those are two key positions for us. But we also have diversity in that we have maintenance grounds, um, social services, security, environmental, <clears throat> rehabilitation, so we are very, um, obviously very, very connected with the workforce in lots of different ways. So when COVID you know, came along, and that was about a year before Elise and I got together on this project, you didn't know what was gonna happen. And, and really, if, you would, if we would have done this project in 2019, I do believe we would have had a very different outcome uh, or different process, different focus, but COVID certainly brought a lot of things to light. And, one of those is that um, we really wanted to reconnect with our employees to find out what matters most. That's, our, that's been on my mind ever since 2021. What does matter most? You know, we've tried everything, uh, food trucks, all kinds of activities, events, drawings, you know, fun things. But the bottom line is that what we learned in 2021 is that that's not really what keep, keeps people in with us. It's fun. It lasts for a day. It really is going back to what Tom and Ellen were sharing, and that's the leadership. <clears throat> and then the focus and the commitment from the leadership showing that we are consistent with our message and we're going to deliver. So um, we focused on the certified nursing assistant. That's a very key role at Masonic. And we, using the maps, uh, at first, I must say, I was very confused. And it took a couple of meetings to really let that sink in as far as, you know, what am I looking at? What can this really do for me and Masonic and our employees? And then it just started clicking. And the, the, um, the outcome maps especially were super helpful because we wanted to work on retention. That is our number one priority. And then along with that is burnout. So we used the outcome maps to really focus in on, again, what matters most. And we knew from past survey work that there are barriers you know, for, to people for coming to work. And one of those is transportation. So, uh, and the other one is from the burnout standpoint, knowing what your schedule is in advance, being able to switch schedules, knowing who is on your team even. You can see you know, who, who, who can I switch with? So we implemented two um, solutions and resources for our employees. The first one I'll talk about is online scheduling. 
we have we we dragged our feet on implementing that so we implemented that last fall and that again is because we had burnout we want to do work life balance and also we want a better handle on what are our openings really when you do a paper schedule sometimes that's very difficult to tell so what are our needs going forward the online scheduling was implemented in november and I, I don't have survey work around that yet, but I do have a lot of solid anecdotal uh, feedback on that. Our employees feel a lot more connected. Um, we The text messaging that came with the electronic scheduling has been heavily, heavily used. So our communications improved. In fact, we've used more than our contract allows. So we know that that is absolutely working. And we also can do a better job of predicting our workforce needs because we have an organized schedule. It goes out you know, for a very long time. Um, there's no more guesswork. One thing that we were able to do with electronic scheduling is we realized that one of our communities was still doing eight hour shifts for the CNAs. Well, that creates a lot more job openings and a lot less efficiency. So just uh, a month ago, we moved to 12 hour shifts and our employees were immediately able to latch onto that. It took us one pay period to get the majority of our CNAs on board because of the electronic scheduling. They could see their schedule you know, for a very long time out, uh, work with the scheduler if one day didn't quite work out just now for them. <clears throat> That's helped us significantly as decrease the number of positions that we, we know we have open and have to fill. So the second thing is dealing with this transportation issue. Um, we have, uh, many employees that do, do take the bus. We have a public transportation system that has a bus stop right here in Louisville, right in front of our campus. So we noticed the bus you know, comes and goes at different times, but I really didn't understand the importance of knowing the bus schedule until we started looking at our shifts and employees with their attendance and things like that. So we offered, uh, we partnered with TARC, which is our local transportation company, and we did a pilot, and that started in October. We provided free TARC passes, no restrictions. They could use them on the weekends. They could take their kids to school, whatever it is. We provided that for our employees who wanted them. And right now, we have 45 employees that have the TARC pass. I do have data on that. When we look at our retention at Masonic, you know, we're right about 60% after we go through 2020 and 2021. The employees that have the TARC pass, we are at 89% retention. So that is, to me, a big win. And in fact, our pilot program lasted six months. It ends this month. And we are going to extend that for at least another year and continue to provide that benefit. <clears throat> so that was a big win for us as well. You know, one thing that really helped us with, the, um, with this process and the outcome maps is that that led us to do more. We did not have quite a robust survey survey process like I thought we did. We learned that along here to, this way too. So we're doing some survey work right now that really hones in on what matters most to the employees. That might be the individual, it might be the department. We just really wanna focus on that and make sure that we are providing the right resources for our employees so that they can be successful. So those are, uh, those are the, how we utilize the maps. Um, and what some of the outcomes are so far with the process. Can I just jump in real quick? And I don't know if you intentionally did not mention this, Tracy, but I think you're also taking a really holistic view of like, yes, this is the intervention we're putting in place, but what do our employees need to really glom onto that? So I'm thinking of the, the data plan that you have in connection with the, the scheduling. Um, and I just thought that was, really thoughtful of thinking, okay, we have this, this new shiny thing, this, this new tool that we're going to be offering to our staff. We need to make sure all of our staff have access to that mm -hmm. tool. So, yes. um, so just know that it's, it's not just the one thing, like there, there are some ripple effects and, you know, Tracy's done a great job of considering those ripple effects as well. Yeah, we, uh, we want access. So we're working with Verizon and we're gonna be able to offer all of our employees a cell phone for them and their families at a very reduced rate. So that, that's a result of the technology. You know, a lot of people just don't have the data, the data with. So that's the thing that we've done. You're right, Elise. It's all about the communication, but really just getting real, keeping it real and trying to figure out what matters most. I really love that story, Tracy. And it's it's great to hear that. Like, it sounds like both of these programs have been super impactful, but 
clearly you're collecting data now, at least around the transportation program that's proving it for your company. So that's wonderful to hear. We did get a question which you may have started to touch on, which is you, you had mentioned previously the text messaging system and Anna and Candle has asked about who employees precisely are texting with, if it's if it's directly with each other or there's a scheduler between them. Both. They can they can connect with their uh, co-workers if they want to switch a schedule. So they can request a switch and that goes to the scheduler. So the scheduler ultimately sees what kind of movement's being requested and they make those approval decisions. So that's how that's going right now. It's strictly around the scheduling. Um, and you, we use it also to communicate some events with the company or uh, open enrollment, you know, those kinds of things too, which has been super beneficial. We never really had that texting option before. So it's being used in multiple ways, but our employees are communicating with each other and with the scheduling supervisor. That's great, thank you. I'm curious about something else that you were getting at too, which is um, you talked about how it, the kind of working with outcome maps helped you kind of get better at your surveying process. Can you say more about like, like did the maps help you kind of figure out what areas to survey people about and what not to? Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, we knew the bucket was turnover or retention and then of course burnout. But how do you drill down on that? And what questions do you ask and what tools do you use? I was kind of stumped with that. So the, the outcome maps really helped me hone in on some of those characteristics that are important and I knew they were and how those mapped up, map, matched up with those two, those two areas that we wanted to improve. And what we learned along the way is that, you know, we did not have a good survey tool that really got down to the nitty gritty and that was um, flexible and nimble. So we were partnering with a U of University of Louisville researcher and his company is called Org Vitals. And we just started this at one of our locations and we're uh, next week and the week after we're gonna you know, um, broadcast it far and wide. But it's really about you know, having employees build trust so that they'll do the first survey anonymously. When we see the low hanging fruit, things that we know we can fix immediately, that builds trust. And our goal is to get these um, not anonymous surveys so that we can really figure out, you know, what does, uh, what does, you know, Sally Smith CNA, what does she really need to get this job done? And what does her department need? So that, that really helped me understand a lot more the importance of having a lot of transparency in these surveys. And I realized we really didn't, our employees just didn't trust the process. So we're hoping that this will really you know, bring us along uh, in a big way. That's great to hear. Thank you, Tracy. I see another question. No, we are not unionized. Yeah, thank you for that. It's, I mean, there's a mix across the National Fund Network. There are, of course, some unionized companies mm -hmm. in the network and many that are not. And there are some of these things can be dealt with through collective bargaining. That's true. I'm one one area that the maps get into is actually you know, kind of under that worker voice or employee voice perspective. Um, is collective bargaining is one engine for that. But what they also show is that there are a lot of other potential engines for that kind of deepening understanding of employee feedback and identifying systems that can really address those problems and make the hopefully improve the, the employees' lives as well as the company's performance. Yeah, it's just taking advantage of the resources, whether it's union or non-union, really looking at what's available to be utilized and are we utilizing it correctly, whether it's the voice, collective voice, or, you know, it's, again, the survey work and things like that. I think everybody has an opportunity to hone in on, on what help, can help them get better with the resources already in place. Awesome, thank you, Tracy. So that's the end of our main presentation. We have kind of a little preview to share before we go, but I wanna take this moment to um, open, open up the conversation to a broader Q&A um, and feel free to chime in through the Q&A function um, or in the chat, whatever you prefer. So we have a question from Kelly. So based on your experience at Masonic Homes, how would you recommend introducing the maps to interested employers? Well, first of all, um, Ellen, I really, you have mastered this presentation and explained that very succinctly. 
I think that it's really about the clarity of the communication. And look, our partners at least did an amazing job. It's just getting your head around that. And, and I think that is that to me was one of the, again, it took me a couple of meetings to really figure that out. But that is, you know, starting with a problem and showing how the maps can solve that. There's a lot of um, characteristics in there and the questions that really help me hone in on solving the question, the issue. And that that just to me streamlined conversations. So it wasn't an easy concept for me to even explain to our senior management team, but we see the results of that. So um, I think just being very clear with what you what the expectation is and having several examples to share as far as what how this can work and why we need to begin thinking about this in a more broad sense. And I'll add to that that Tom, you know, does a great job of framing the, the discussion, like without the maps in front of you, that discussion around what are your business challenges or organizational challenges? What are the things that are, you know, keeping your CEO up at night? And identifying those business challenges leads to the focus on the KPIs, like, you know, what is in the strategic plan? And identifying that those most important issues first then allows when you look at the maps to say, oh, there it is. It's that thing right there. That's the one we have to address. And then to you know, sort of articulate, well, that thing that you care about that is crucial to your success is correlated with these particular job characteristics. So if we want to reach this goal, the science says, if we address these characteristics, that could be a pathway. And then again, how do you choose which characteristic or characteristics to focus in on? That's where employee voice comes in. And, and I think that idea of, well, we could do that one. Let's do that. It, it's possible for us. Evidence suggests that should help you reach your goal. However, if there are, let's say, 12 possible characteristics and the one that you picked is number 11 on the list for your employees, it's probably not the most impactful step you can take, even though it looks like the easiest one. So that's where the power of bringing your employee's voice into that process of selecting what you're going to work on to improve job quality for business impact. Th that's the, the moment where, you know, I think you have the sort of the chance to say, you know, what looks easiest may not be the most impactful and finding out which one is most impactful relies on knowing what our employees needs are. I'll add one more observation to that, which is I've come to think of the maps in some ways as the, uh, the workplace development equivalent of eat this, not that, which is the maps tell you what you should be surveying, survey this, don't survey that, or interview about this, don't interview about that. A lot of companies, when they in, kind of embark on a organizational change process like the one that Tracy has described, they will often think whatever, you know, whatever intervention that we decide to implement, that'll hopefully impact the goals that we have. The maps don't exactly narrow the field all the way down for that, but they help you kind of close that gap, figure out what areas you really want to be talking to people about. So you can, if you're, if you're surveying your employees or if you're interviewing them, or if you have some other way of gathering information from them and elevating their voice, you know what to ask about, what questions are kind of be, going to be the most powerful, the most impactful for this kind of change. We have a few other questions that have come in, so I just want to address, get these addressed. I think Tracy is answering one of them. Um, someone asked, do the maps work in worker cooperative settings? Um, speaking as someone who has some direct experience with worker cooperatives, there is no reason why they wouldn't. Um, the only caveat I would add is a lot of worker co-ops, at least in the United States, tend to be smaller organizations. And if you have, you know, just 10 or so employees, the maps themselves may not be as necessary because you can just talk directly um, about the stuff and figure, co-create co a solution. But there are large co-ops, though. In fact, the largest worker co-op in the US is Cooperative Home Care Associates. It's another long-term care provider in New York City. They have over, over 2,000 employees. They could certainly use these maps um, as ways to figure out new improvement processes. And then, Tracy has answered another question um, through the Q&A process. I'll get to the next one live. 
what are some best practices for survey design for employees? Um, Ellen, do you wanna take that one? Sure, well, I so appreciate the, the question because I think oftentimes people think that survey design is easy. Um, survey design is science and it is art, but it is not easy. And it's very important um, to, as Tracy was saying, to really focus on what is it that you want to know? And I think importantly, what will be actionable? So while it's very important and in any survey that we would do, we would ask questions about job satisfaction, you know, all in all, how satisfied are you um, with your current job? That's very important, but it's not as specific and actionable as um, do you, what kinds of opportunities do you feel that you have to advance in this organization? Um, and, and so I think part of it is to think about with each question, what will we do with this answer? How will this answer allow us to take action? And, you know, one of the, the wonderful things about surveys is that, you know, they can be quick and easy and you can get people to give you their, their opinions in a, you know, in a more anonymous type of a way. At the same time, if your survey is too long, you will not get full response. So um, we encourage folks, and I know it's painful to try to keep your survey to about 20 questions. So now you really have to say, well, what do I really wanna know? Because we wanna know everything, um, but keeping your survey to a, a really short, concise list of questions that will be relevant to what you're trying to achieve, you know, that will help you understand the things you need to know to take action. And then you know, keeping it short and sweet um, is very important. When we get into other technical questions of survey design, like, for example, do I use a five point agree disagree scale or a four point scale? Um, should I ask people whether they are um, happy and satisfied at their jobs? Those are two different things. Do you want me to tell you whether I'm happy or do you want me to tell you whether I'm satisfied? Don't do that. It's got to be one thing. Some of those are more technical questions about design, but I think the key focus is what do you want to know and how will you act on the answer to each one of those questions? Ellen, can you say a little bit more about, I mean, I know there's the exact question you want to ask will depend on the strategy that you're undertaking, um, but regarding those five employer outcomes that are central to the maps, like what are some sample questions and potential ways that you can ask about those? <laughs> We, uh, we have done a bunch of uh, reviews of journal articles and uh, to see how folks have asked these questions. Um, and there, there are many different approaches, but one that I wanna point out in particular uh, is the question around turnover. Um, you know, when we, when we try to measure turnover using our HRAS data, for example, um, it's very tricky, right? You know, how many open positions do we have? How many open positions did we have? If someone is promoted, there's an open position. Is that turnover? Um, you know, somebody who is not working out, we've managed them out and they leave the organization. Is that turnover? But what we want to really focus in on is keeping the folks that we really want to keep. So when we, in social science, we measure intention. Um, so for example, um, I plan to leave my job as soon as possible. Um, this is a company that I would want to stay with as long as I can. So part of what you're trying to understand is what people's intentions are, and that allows us to measure what behaviors or what actions they might take in the future. Um, when we're measuring things like burnout, um, one of the, the sort of best set of questions that I've seen talks about, you know, it uses language that people can relate to. So I feel drained at the end of my work day. Um, there's a series of questions you can ask about. I feel emotionally drained at the end of my workday. I feel physically drained at the end of my workday. And that allows you to apply it to your particular context. So when Tracy was talking about CNAs, I, you know, I could imagine that I feel drained at the end of my day is very important to know. But I would want to understand the extent to which folks are feeling emotionally drained versus physically drained because the nature of the job um, it, you know, involves both things. And the ways that you might address that um, to address uh, issues of burnout you know, would be a different approach. Um, other, am I hitting on what you're looking for, Tom? Yeah, exactly. One thing I'll add to that, and I can... I can say this because unlike Ellen, I am not a scientist. I have an MBA, which is not nearly as rigorous, um, is that there are ways that employers think about each one of these kind of main outcomes that may connect for them more directly with things, with, with items in their income statement or in their balance sheet that relate to their bottom line. 
So turnover, you know, everyone understands turnover is a cost to organizations on numerous fronts. It affects your training costs. It affects um, some productivity that can be lost when you're, you're changing out one person for another and you have to start over. Um, or if you can't fill a position, like those are services that you can't provide for a while. Um, similarly, burnout, there is increasing evidence that burnout relates to the healthcare costs that employers take on in paying for employee care. Um, and so that impacts your benefits package. Um, and there, again, like individual performance is something that obviously speaks quite clearly to productivity, um, employee engagement, probably the best studied of all five of these outcomes. Um, as Ellen mentioned, like it is tied to revenue, performance for companies, profitability for companies. So when you're talking to employers about this stuff, one thing I would try to get them thinking about is their own cost structure and how they can kind of really understand like what, what are the bottom line impacts for them here that they need to pay attention to. So I think we have answered most questions. I mean, just have a couple minutes left. Um, let's go ahead to the last slide, Josh, the next slide. Um, so as a follow-up to this, next month, we have a second webinar that is gonna take what we talked about today and build on it. Um, and the topic of that one is gonna be designing a human-centered workplace. The outcome map work that Ellen and her team led was part of a larger project where we were, we and, and a number of our national fund collaboratives were working with about 12 different employers across the country who had committed to an experiment where they were gonna redesign jobs by engaging their workers in the process, actually engaging their whole team in that. And that, that effort was um, facilitated by a company called Design Impact who were another key partner of ours in that work. And what we found is that the job quality maps really strengthened the work of um, human-centered design in the workplace and vice versa. They turned out to be quite complementary. So when you're thinking about how to actually utilize these in a workplace setting and developing a pilot, this is the session that will help you figure out the next steps for that. It's gonna be April 28th, two to 3 p.m. Um, we have not sent out the registration form yet, but it will be ready soon. So keep an eye out for that. And with that, I wanna thank our panelists, um, Ellen and Tracy and Elise, you are all fantastic. This has been a wonderful session. We really appreciate your voices and perspective on this important topic. If there are no other questions. I'm happy to give everyone two minutes back of their day. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Tom.